All right, so keep in your prayers, uh, Norm. I don't see his, the rest of his family here. So I don't know the latest update on Norm as far as his health goes. He was admitted to United, and they were doing some tests. And um, so this past week was a hard week for Norm and for his family. So I don't have the latest update, but keep him in your prayers. That would really be good. Uh, and we are going to, at this point, jump back into the book of Mark, chapter 8. So if you join me there, that would be great. If you like to have a Bible in front of you, we have plenty in the back that you can, that you can borrow, you can take if you want. Uh, most of the passages are on the screen, so you can always look at the screen before your face. And I have to admit something, that last week we were sort of negative. We were really negative, beginning in the chapter 8 of Mark. Uh, we looked at three ways you can know for certain if you don't have faith. Kind of a negative thing, right? Uh, we looked at one of those issues being if your heart is hard, if you're hardened or growing more hard to who Christ is and you probably don't have faith, that could be a sign. Uh, also, if your desire is for something that Jesus is never going to give in the first place, we talked about that a little bit, then that's probably a sign that you don't have faith. If you're constantly desiring and looking for something that Jesus just isn't going to give, then you're going down the wrong direction. That's kind of a negative thing. And also we looked at, you know, if a good sign that you don't have faith is if you really prefer another direction other than Christ. Uh, and we looked at that in that passage and kind of developed that a little bit. All those three things were very negative, right? So I'm going to reverse things a little bit this morning. Well, actually a lot. Last week we were negative, and this week we're going to be positive. We're going to look at things from a different angle and see how Scripture develops uh, this idea. So let's look at things a little differently. What if you do have faith? Last week, you, these are signs you don't have faith. Well, wait a second. What if you do have faith? Or at least you're starting to have faith. Or you're somewhere in that foggy in between land where there's something rattling around and you're not sure what it is. What if you do have faith? Now, you may think, as I've talked to a lot of people, I know a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of friends even, uh, when it comes to the topic of faith, and we talk about Jesus and having faith, believing or trusting in him, things get weird. <laughs> uh, folks get nervous. And one of the immediate go-to issues or thoughts that, that folks have is, well, that's not me because I'm not that kind of person. I'm not a religious person. Of course that's not me. That's for other nicer people uh, when, it, when we talk about faith and, and that immediately equates with religion, whether in your world that's a negative term or a positive. You know, it depends on who you are, what you're, where you're from. But a lot of people instantly think, oh, okay, this is not my conversation because faith, trust, belief, Jesus, that stuff, those are religious terms, and, well, that's not me. And where other folks, when we ask the question, what if, you, what if you do have faith? Other people say, of course I have faith. I was raised in faith. I had a family that always went to church. Uh, that's similar to my experience. So, of course, duh, what a dumb question. Uh, I was raised believing. Or, or some have said, I've always believed. As long as I can remember going back to infancy or before that, I have always believed in Jesus. So there's always some question marks that kind of pop up in my head. Always? Really? Always? So uh, I don't know. I don't know for sure about that. There, maybe you're one of those two that kind of extremes, or maybe you're somewhere in the middle, kind of a blending uh, of those questions. Some general observations I've made from the book of Mark that I hope are helpful for all of us this morning. Number one. Thinking you've learned all there is to know about faith almost certainly means you haven't learned all there is to know about faith. If there's anything that we see, there's a couple things here that we see, and when Jesus interacts with people, and on the one side there's the religious people. Could be the elite people of his day, those who are like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who have more power or more influence on people, or they're more religious in general. So there is this 
expectation, there is this assumption because of what we've learned and our background and our, our, our uh, ethnicity, you name it, that we've arrived. Of course we have faith, right? As long as I can ever remember I've believed or I've had faith. So the, the tricky thing there is when you go down, or at least too far down that road, there is an assumption, a huge assumption, that because I've always known about certain things that are religious, then I equate that with, well, of course I have faith because I know all this stuff. The people that Jesus interacts with that we might think as we read these accounts that, well, they have the history and they have the original testament. They've got all these stories. They have the shared understanding. Well, of course they have faith. Those are the, the people that struggle the most with faith. And those are the people where Jesus is astounded by their lack of faith. Man, what a head-scratcher that is for Jesus' time and even possibly for our time. So the second thing is this. If you're aware of your need in light of the truth, okay, the need for faith, the need that, there's some, that, that, that you have, that the awareness that there's something missing, in light of the truth of God and what he reveals in his word, then you're closer to faith than you think. So here's the other scandalous thing. And when I say scandalous, it truly is scandalous. The people that Jesus interacts with, as we've already seen, the Syrophoenician woman, Gentile woman, no religious background as far as uh, Ju Judaism, Hebrewism, whatever. No background. The Gentile Roman officer, no background, no understanding of that. These are the people that Jesus is surprised, even astounded, by their faith. And even he says, these people have more faith. I've never seen so much faith in all my dealings with, with Israel. These pe that's scandalous stuff. They shouldn't have faith. Or in Jesus' day, the, react, the crowd reaction was they can't have faith. Not that they sh just shouldn't. They can't. These people are on the outside. These people are dirty, unclean. There's no way God could accept them the way they are. Yet, Jesus says, never have I seen so much faith. Never. The, 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 the wording is always, well, not always, but most of the time is astounded. Jesus is astounded by faith from people that really shouldn't have it. I can't emphasize enough just how scandalous that is in Jesus' time. And, and, Still today, there are people that we might, we, meaning the inside Christian types, the people who look like we have it together, there are people that we may write off because they don't look or act or sound like they have it together in a Christian way, but maybe still, still today, they are exhibiting faith that far surpasses and outreaches those who are Christian, as an adjective, uh, or religious. That can still happen, and in fact, I think it does happen today. So, when the Bible is used out of context, so uh, let's move on to, are you starting to see? Okay? Are you at a place where something is clicking, and you're starting to think or to believe differently? Maybe your whole life, a certain response, a certain understanding, a certain approach to God or Jesus or the Bible, but maybe there's something rattling around in there uh, that says, ah, something isn't quite right. So I talked to a guy this past week. He is older than me. For those of you younger than me, that's really old, okay? We'll just leave it at that. Talking to him, he comes over. Uh, uh, we're sitting there at Caribou. And every once in a while, people start, you know, pouring out their life <laughs> in caribou, which is like, what's happening here? Okay, so we'll just walk right into that. And he was telling me that he was watching, and I can't remember who it was, and it's fine, I don't remember who it was. He was watching some guy on TV, tele-evangelist preacher kind of guy on TV. And this guy was saying something, I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, there was something that he was saying that the gentleman I'm talking to uh, is thinking, you know what, that is not 
there's just something about that that isn't right. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is. And he has a Bible at home. So you know what? Instead of just kind of listening to something and believing it, I'm going to test it. I'm going to get my Bible out. I'm going to look up some verses. I'm going to use the, my handy concordance in the back. I don't know where everything is, which is fine. Table of contents, there's a reason why it's there. Okay? So he starts looking at different verses, uh, and he comes to the point where he decides that what he was saying was out of context. It didn't make sense because it wasn't in the Bible in the first place. And that led him to this whole new process, this whole new journey of faith. And as he shared, I could just see the light, you know, his eyes widen, the, there's joy there on his face, that he, it wasn't just about, you know, a pride thing, like proving somebody else wrong, I've got the answer, he doesn't. <laughs> it wasn't that, I, I'm smarter than the guy on TV. It led him a whole different route, like reading scripture enlivened him and his faith. There was something in light, like I said earlier, in light of the truth, he is embracing the truth of God, and he got an answer to one question, but everything else starts to open up, and his eyes are open to new truth. And he told me that that was kind of a turning point with him and his faith. What a wonderful thing. God's truth is still living and active. He just opened it up and started reading, and then God started speaking to him. And faith took on a whole new level. That, for him, was a point where he's starting to see. He's starting to see things and understand his faith in a whole new, in a whole different way. So, how do I know if I can see by faith? Let me just throw out a few questions here before we get into the text. Are you, like this guy I just talked about, are you starting to see things differently? Is there an ache or a longing for more? In other words, do you long for something that is larger than yourself? So much of what I read and what I watch and the, some of the conversations I have, that's a theme that comes out. Are you kind of in that place? There's an ache or there's a longing. There's got to be something else. Else, What I see and what I experience and what I'm doing in this life, it, to some level it may be really grand. But you know what? There's still something else and I don't know exactly what it is. Is there an unsettled feeling, like you're just spinning your wheels in life? Like, yeah, the, the cash flow is there, and the house is great, and, and things are going okay with the family, but there's still something else. I just feel like I'm going nowhere in life. Uh, maybe you sense that there, is a, th there has to be a good that is greater than your self-interest. Again, you can spend a lot of time being real happy with the stuff that you have, but there's got to be a good higher than that, right? It can't be just what about uh, the things I enjoy and what society says are, are good or even great things to have or, or enjoy in life. Those things are good, but mm, there's, there's something still missing. There's got to be something more. I'm not just a product of biological random circumstances that, that created me and, and put me on this planet, and when I die, well, I'm dead. There's something innate, there's something within us, who I think is what Scripture says, that God puts eternity in the hearts of man, that just longs for something else. I'm not just a lump of tissue that just happened to exist. There's something within all of us that fights back against that, right? Am I right? Then maybe I'm created by someone who knows me personally, and loves me so much that he wants me to experience more. That he has something for me that is far greater than anything temporary or temporal. So, if, that, if any of those questions are, th are questions that you've wrestled with, that pop up every once in a while, I'm telling you, maybe you're at a point where you're ready to know and see by faith. Maybe you're at a point where you think, thought you were seeing by faith, trusting and believing, but those, those things are still there. Maybe they're creating an ache that, you know what? What I've had, I've settled for. And what Jesus has is something far greater. And it's the next step. Maybe that's the place where I'm supposed to be moving towards where God wants me to be. So, three questions. 
that come out of our text this morning. The first one is, do I see that there's hope? That there's hope for everyone, anyone, who struggles to believe, okay? It's just at the point where it's not even there. I don't get any of this, and I'm so caught up with myself, or I'm so blinded to the fact that there could be something more. There's hope for everyone, even at that state or that stage. How do I know this? So we're going to backtrack a little bit. We were real negative last week. We're going to find something positive in what we read last week that I didn't point out. So back to last week. The disciples with Jesus. There's a bunch of hungry people around. If you were here, you remember that. If you weren't here, that's okay. We're filling in the blanks. There's a bunch of hungry people around. The disciples answered him, speaking back, how can one How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? How can we do this? Jesus pointed out the fact that there's all these hungry people, and what do we do? The disciples respond with anything but Jesus, you're the answer. (laughs) Anything but Jesus, we know, at least based on what you've done in the past, Jesus, that you can do it again. That's faith. They don't have even that. They can't even say from experience, well, well, you did it before. Maybe you could do it again. None of that. How? How can this happen? No faith. Zip. Zero. Zilch. And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Now, what, what does Jesus not do? You morons! Well, we've been down this road before. And because you didn't respond in faith, I'm going to wipe all of you out. Right now, I'm calling down lightning bolts from heaven, and you're all fried. Now, that sounds ridiculous. How similar is that to how a whole lot of us respond out of fear to God? Because I don't have faith, and I don't trust, and I don't believe you, then what is, certainly what is God going to do? I mean, not to the religious nice types, but what is God going to do to me, the non-religious, really yucky types, and, you know, all this yucky stuff I've done? What is God going to do? Certainly, he's going to strike me and blot me out. What does Jesus do? All right, we're going to take a step back. How many loaves do you have? Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd, And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied. Jesus doesn't strike them down and wipe them out. He gives them yet another reason that even they, without faith, still have hope. Jesus is still present, and he still is that gracious. That gracious. Think about that. I have no faith. I do not want to believe. I can't believe. And he still extends mercy even to a person who rejects faith. Okay? They took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people. And then after they were filled up and, and filled with all this food, he sent them away. What separates always throughout history... What separates the living from the dying is hope. I love reading real, true-life, adventure kind of stories where normal, everyday, average people are caught up in the extraordinary. And it never, it never ceases to amaze me that people without resources, without adequate clothing, food, or shelter, that some people in the worst of situations still live, while others don't. I I used a couple weeks ago a a story from the Donner Party, 1847, 48, whatever it was, uh, that uh, a book I was reading recently, and it just lays out all those horrible things that they went through. Uh, There was in in December of that terrible year, up high up in the mountains, out of desperation, a group of people, all they had, they fashioned snowshoes out of leftover pieces of their wagons. And they attached them to their feet. No provisions. Their clothes were just falling off their bodies at this point. Out in wicked blizzard conditions. But they're absolutely desperate to try to make it over the last mountain range to try to find help. Because where they're at, they're starving to death. They've got to do something. 
So a group of people go out, and they, they camp out here and there once in a while. They're in blizzard conditions. You read the story, and, you know, everything I complain about, <laughs> you know, it just, I, I, I can't believe I'm so, I'm so soft, right? When you hear about what some people have done. So and there's, there's this one point. They're, they sat around this, this tiny little campfire trying to keep from freezing to death this one night. They get up in the morning shivering, half dead. And there's one guy in the party who is sitting there, and they, the rest of them, they gather this stuff, and they, they start off again walking and hoping to find something. And this guy just sits there, and he says, he says something to the effect that, you know, I'll catch up. Uh, he never caught up. He's sitting there smoking his pipe. The survivors tell the story. And uh, it was a year or two later, they found his bones in the same spot, and the pipe was still there. He didn't get up. There was something within him that said, I'm done. And you read about that in survival stories all the time. People, some people get to the point where, I can't. I'm going to sit here and smoke my pipe until I'm dead. And that's exactly, apparently, what he did. Why does anybody survive? Answer, there was hope. Against every single odd, a handful of those people walked out of the mountains and were eventually rescued because they believed there was still hope. There is a reason to push on no matter what. It just blows my mind that some people still get through the worst possible circumstances. What separates the living from the dying is hope. Now think about that in the context of believers. What separates those from living and dying spiritually is hope in Christ. Gospel hope is grounded in not in the strength of our own ability. Because I can just get there and I can just do it and I can just be a better person. Uh Uh-uh. That is not gospel-centered. That is not Jesus-centered. So the gospel hope that we speak of here all the time and what we see in Scripture, and that's just one more example, what Jesus delivers is not (laughs) based on what the disciples can give. They don't have it. Gospel hope is not grounded in the strength of our ability to believe at any point in any of our lives as if at some point we can have just enough faith to finally this day feel confident that we're Christians. Hmm. At every step along the way through all the doubts, through all the confusions, through all the real life struggles that we face, the hope that we have is grounded in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The only way we can move forward in hope is knowing and reminding ourselves that Jesus is enough, that his grace is sufficient. That's what Paul learned in all of his struggles with all these difficulties that he faced. It is not about him. The end result is, Jesus, you're enough. And if I hope in that, in that very simple and life-changing truth, then I can make it. Because if my hope is in Him, then I have hope today and tomorrow, no matter what comes against me. So, His rule, His kingdom, we've talked a lot about the kingdom of Jesus. That's what He has come to establish. Kingdom, that doesn't work modern day, but His rule, His reign, His supremacy, whatever word you want to use, that Jesus is enough, that he is that great, that he has established that kind of hope. I love the end of the book of Acts. I like the whole book. But especially the end of the book, it would be so great dramatically. I don't, why doesn't somebody, you know what, there was a movie, there's a TV movie. If anybody's as old as me, or older, you might remember way back, there was, I think it was a made-for-TV movie, or uh, episode, multi-show uh, episode thing. And I think Anthony Hopkins played Paul. Anybody remember this? Somebody YouTube it after we're done. I, I see the face of Anthony Hopkins when he was younger playing, saying, yeah, <laughs> all right, put the phones down. Don't do it now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Anthony Hopkins. It's hard to imagine Anthony Hopkins playing a spiritual person in, in, my, in my world. Anyway, Somebody ought to do this. It's so awesome. You read chapters, what, 23 through the end of the book. Paul, at three or four times, he is on trial. He is before 
the, either the religious leaders or he's before the Roman leaders, the propped up Roman leaders. And he's standing there on trial, and each to act, Acts chapter 23, Acts chapter 26, Acts, Acts chapter 28, at least three different times when Paul is shackled and before people who can kill him, who can just say, done, and it's over, right? He, he, he's before that kind of power. Before these people, what does he talk about every single time? He talks about hope. What? Hope, not in himself. Hope, as he says in chapter 26, respect, he, I stand here now, this day, in respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead. That is why I'm on trial. He stands there because he knows Jesus lives. He spoke to him. Actually, Jesus spoke to him first when he wasn't believing. You ever think about that? Paul didn't have a conversion experience like what we talk about today, that at some point he realizes his need and he places his trust in Jesus. Jesus appears and speaks to him and says, I'm going to send you and you're going to learn how much you're going to suffer for me. Okay, <laughs> who are you again? All right. Jesus' plan was to use him even before he realized it. And here at the end of the book of Acts, he's saying, I'm standing, I am here because Jesus lives and my hope is not, doesn't have anything to do with my circumstances. My hope is in Christ. Boom. And now I'm going to speak to you about him, even though you can kill me right now. Isn't that awesome? Even at the end of the book, even if somebody did a movie about the last part of Paul's life, it would be awesome. Uh, he speaks of Jesus. He speaks compellingly the hope. The, uh, the officers, i, I got to paraphrase. I don't have it in front of me. But, you know, but uh, uh, the, the official says, what does he say? Uh, would you even convince me now to be a Christian? Are you crazy that <laughs> you're talking about this stuff? And what does Paul say? I would, if, with all my being, I would want you to have what I have except for these chains. Awesome. You can't make that, you can't write that stuff. Man, it stirs me every time I read it. I want you to have what I have, not, not these chains, but what's in here. Because I'm free. These chains don't matter. They never did. Jesus freed me. I want you to know that. What enables a person to live like that? It's hope. Not based on what we can do, based on what Jesus has done. And that changes everything. Are you beginning to understand that you can have that same hope? The hope that changes you. The hope that makes you say stuff that may sound crazy. The hope that makes you live in a way that probably looks crazy, that compels, that motivates, that changes everything. That's what Jesus does in the heart of a person who believes. Let's move on. How do I know if I can see by faith? Do I see that there's hope? Can I see that there is a process, that there's something going on? Seeing with the eyes of faith is a sign that Christ is at work in this process of restoring you. So here's this crazy, weird account. None of the other gospel writers have this account. And people read it and go, huh? And th so we're going to read it. We're not going to do huh. We're going to figure out what it means. So Mark eight twenty two, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent, his, and he sent him to his home saying, Do not even enter the village. We find this account sandwiched between these other accounts and these other things go going on that have something to do with sight. And we have something to do physically with sight, but also kind of in a spiritual way, in a metaphorical way. Do you see or do you hear? Are your senses perceiving something that's outside the physical realm? We have that going on. And then we have in, in the, next, the following verses, as everything builds in the book of Mark up to this point, where Jesus is, is at, well, we'll get to that in just a second. But it's building to the point where this is decision time. So none of the other gospel writers record this, and it seems weird because it almost seems to suggest that Jesus is insufficient. 
that his power is limited somehow. And we don't read it like that because there is no reason to. That everywhere in the Gospels, even when Jesus says, go, this person is healed or this person is living or whatever, that it happens, that there is always this complete understanding that Jesus is, is sufficient in every way to do anything that he wants to do. So why does he heal this guy like this? That there is something going on here that isn't about Jesus' sufficiency, but it's how we ought to be responding to him in the way that he chose to work in this guy's life, and then how Mark chooses his account to put it right in the middle of the sandwich going on that should be an eye-opener for all of us. There's something happening about God's work to restore. What does it mean to restore? So, here's an example. This is a 1939 Mercury. Maybe some of you have seen it. Dayton's working on this car to restore it. So how's he doing so far? All right. There's the steering column. The key is in it. Good thing, right? <laughs> you still got the key. In case you want to try to start it up, it's right there. Huh? Not a whole lot left of the front of the car there. Yeah, and, and there's some issues, right, that, you're, that Dayton is working on still. Now there's the frame. Uh, and Dayton has done a ton of work, along with some, some friends, to restore the engine block. And that's the original block, right? Yeah. So, and you had to take it out of state, actually, right? To have some work done on it. To Iowa. There's great things in Iowa. <laughs> it's sort of weak. Okay. So we all affirm that. All right. So, the engine block has been worked on, and restored as far as you know to the point where it needs to be okay uh it's rebuilt completely rebuilt and you see the frame there the tires need a little work but that's probably not the issue right now that you need to address so progress is being made so dayton also sent me a picture of what it looked like in 1939 right so this is when it was almost brand new so it's brand new when your dad bought it so drove out of the dealership brand spanking new 19. 39. What a process, right? To take something that's that old, okay, with all the issues, and to begin painstakingly, lovingly tearing that car apart and piece by piece address. You can't leave anything out because it's not going to start. Piece by piece, you start with the guts of it, the heart of it, the engine, the core, and then begin to work out until finally, hopefully, it will be this good or better, right? And Dayton and his family will be driving down the street, waving at people in, in the, you know, leprechaun days or whatever with flags flowing out there. And everybody will go, wow, look at that awesome car. I wonder what year that is. Isn't that cool? And Dayton will say, yeah, it's cool. I spent the last 80 years working on it. <laughs> you better believe it's cool, right? So there is something awesome about taking uh, uh, the kind of effort and uh, attention and time in taking something that is pretty beat up and old and rusted uh, and on its way out to the junk heap and restoring it to something that is going to look like new. There is a lot like what's going on in Dayton's garage that is so similar to what Jesus is doing in us. Now, I ran across a quote. I can't, remember, I can't remember which guy I was reading. It might be Tim Keller, who says some cool things every once in a while. Uh, and it might have been somebody else, but I'm not quite sure. But here's what, what I read. It just it floored me for that afternoon. Most of the week I was thinking about. Here it is. I think I've got another. Yeah, here it is. The kingdom work of Jesus in a believer's life is not consolation, but restoration. Now, let that sink in. Man, it knocked me off the chair for a while. So many times, I, when I read Scripture, when I approach my understanding, my relationship with Jesus, it's more like consolation. They're there. It's going to be okay. Uh, don't worry about the hard stuff. I'll take the hard stuff out. Uh, it's more the pat-on-the-back Christianity kind of, kind of viewpoint. That's not what the kingdom is about. Now, if Dayton had that approach to his car, there, there, <laughs> I know it's been a rough life. You're a little bit rusty. 
it, you know, it's been hard on you, I can tell. So we'll just kind of baby you along and kind of hope for the best. <laughs> Where is that going to leave you with that car? It ain't going to work for very long. You got to pull it apart. You got to take it apart. You got to break it down piece by piece, re- working at restoring what's going on. In a similar fashion, Jesus is not about just consoling you and doing the pat on the back, kind of, it's okay, faith. Jesus is at work at restoring you. That there was a plan that God had before sin entered in and wrecked and destroyed everything. There was a plan that Jesus had for perfection, perfect fellowship with each one of us. And when sin comes in, it brings death every time. It may be pretty and nice and happy in your bed, or it may be ugly and terrible and bloody. It, you know, in that sense, it doesn't matter. Death is death, and sin brings it every time eventually. That is what Scripture tells us. Sin brings death every time. And Jesus is going to do the radical work to take us apart to work at the engine core of our soul and our heart, to tear everything else away, and to begin the painstaking yet loving, brutally difficult work in us to restore, not just to console, to restore. Jesus wants nothing less than what he and the Father planned in the first place. And he wants that in you. And he doesn't come along and come into you and say, now that you see and understand, boom, the troubles are over. It's all good now. Everything's going to be easy. They're there. Everything's going to be sweet and nice and happy in life. God doesn't work that way. And anybody who tells you differently, what's the line? Is trying to sell you something, right? Huh? Little Princess Bride reference? Anybody who tries to give you something and sell you something, they're trying to get you going down the wrong path. It's not what is going on. Jesus works at us to restore us. So, I really do think that's what's going on with this guy when Jesus works, and only this guy only receives his sight, you know, partially. There is a graduated experience, a, a, a gradual experience with Jesus that He wants us to understand as we begin to see, you're you're only going to see part of what he's doing. You're only going to experience a taste now, and and, and it grows and it gets better. That's part of of what happens as we abide and we submit to the rule and authority of Jesus in our life. But don't expect to, wham, it's all over. You see a little bit, and then you're going to see everything. You experience some of it, you get a taste of it, And eventually it grows and becomes as fully established as Jesus works and perfects. He is about kingdom restoration. One last thing. How do I know if I can see by faith? Do I see that there's hope? Yep, there is. Can I see the process? Are you aware that Jesus is at work in you right now, real time? And will I see Jesus for who he really is. Will I see him as far more than just a nice guy or a good teacher? So we'll we'll, uh, wrap up with this part of the passage. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So they go off on this long walk. It's miles and miles, okay? There's all sorts of things the disciples have seen and experienced, miraculous things, tons of teaching that we don't have all the records for. They've been around him for a year and a half, two years. We don't know for sure, but they've been around him for some time now. And it builds to this point as they're going on this long walk together, and Jesus pops this question. Well, who, who do people say that I am? You're interacting, you're mingling, whatever. So what do they say? Well, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others the prophets, which isn't any little thing. John the Baptist was revered. Elijah, he is probably the prophet, at least at this time, that people speak of. Why? He's the one guy that didn't die. 
He's the one guy that was taken up in flaming horses and pretty spectacular. We all wish we could see that happen every once in a while, right? It, it, he didn't die. So if he never died, then maybe, maybe he came back. Maybe this guy's Elijah. So that's, that's pretty big. The, the, what's going around the rumor mill and the, the grapevine and whatever, it, that he's a pretty big guy, that, but that's kind of where it, it ends. Yeah, he's doing miracles, but we're not quite sure what else to make of this guy still. Okay? So Jesus continues, and he asks all of them, they're walking along here and down his path, but who do you say that I am? Because that, that's really what matters right now. It's not... We're not talking about the grapevine anymore. He looks at the disciples, but who do you say that I am? After all this time you've been around me, this is where the rubber hits the road, if they had such a thing. This is where you, I really want to know. What is it that's going on inside you? What does Peter say? He says, you are the Christ. What does Christ mean? It means the anointed one. So prophets and priests, kings, uh, in ancient times, they were anointed. Official kind of declaration with that oil pouring on the head of that individual that set them apart, kind of sanctifying is another word for that, for their role or their office. They were anointed. They were the Messiah or the Christ. So that's where that word comes from. That's the, kind of the background. But by the time of Jesus... Saying that somebody's the Christ is like another level up from that. There is a recognition that if some, that Peter says you're the Christ, you're not just another prophet or even another king. Not just another anointed person. There is, there is all this other expectation that comes with that word. When Peter says you're the Christ, he's not saying just another guy like that. He's saying you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. There is just enough faith, there is just enough belief in imperfect Peter's life that he can see, even if it's just for this moment, okay, and the complications that Peter has, and we'll look at that in, in the coming weeks, but there's just enough faith here that says, you're him. And that's like dropping the bomb in the conversation. And, and we don't know where the rest of the disciples are, but here they're walking along, and Peter throws that one out. <laughs> Ooh. That's like nothing else. And maybe they were thinking that, but maybe no one else dared say it. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are different than anyone else ever has ever been or ever could be. You're the one that God the Father set apart, set aside, for us at least, to find salvation to be redeemed that jesus you're it now let me advance one more here the question that i'm going to leave you with this morning no matter where you're at i think there's there's just rich significance that jesus pops this as they're walking along this whole struggle with who am I and what do I believe and what do I actually see and can I trust you? Do I really believe in you? Uh, it's almost a metaphor as they walk along. It's the journey of life that they're walking on these miles to this next town. We find ourselves right on the same journey, right on the same path. And if you've ever responded to any of those questions, Jesus looks at you and asks the same question. It's not about anybody else right now, anybody else around you, any of your experience in the past, or your family's expectation regarding church or religious services, uh, anything about your family, what we expect your kids to be, none of that stuff. Who do you? You. Jesus says, look at me. Who do you say I am? Is there just enough in your heart that says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. I am going to choose, even though everything's messy and I don't have it all figured out yet, I'm going to take the leap of faith and say, yep, it's you. So have you done that? Even in the messy journey of life where everything's imperfect or complicated, 
and apart from anybody else who could influence you or twist your thinking here and there. When Jesus says, even today, who do you say I am? Do you respond, yep. At this point, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to believe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to us directly, piercing through time and space and distractions to draw our minds and our hearts right into your presence and to be confronted with that question, Lord, is the question of our lives. Is it any of these other things or is it you? Lord, if if you're at work right now, and I pray that you are in our hearts, uh, even if we think we've had it and learned it and known it all, but there's been something banging around that says, you know what, uh, it's still not right because I've never fully believed. <laughs> I've never put my trust in you. And Jesus, make this the time that you provide in your sufficiency the way for us to say, I finally believe that it's you, Jesus, you and not anything else. Work, Lord, to confirm and reinforce and undergird that belief and response to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing some worship songs. Quick personal note, uh, Jennifer and I are going to disappear for a couple days. (laughs) So uh, we are... (laughs) We are at the point, it's, it's time to celebrate Done With Cancer. So over a year and a half. <laughs> over a year and a half of all of that uh, stuff and chemo and radiation and uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> all, all of what uh, that brings. We're at a point where we can say uh, we're done and to God be the glory. So we're going to escape and have fun and enjoy ourselves. And you won't know, well, maybe you know where we'll be at, but (laughs) we're going to come back for a couple of days and just enjoy the life that he's given. So that's where we're at. So I just thought I'd kind of throw that out. Yep. All right, let's sing.